All right, so first off, I wanted to, of course, thank Grace Marie, Tara, Sterling, and Jenna for all, all the great work they did to make this paper, make this event happen. I wanted to thank Congressman Price, Dr. Shares, Dr. Armstrong as well for being here today. While much has been said about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, debates have really thus far failed to address the impact that it's gonna have on patients, doctors, and the practice of medicine. My Gale and White paper that you guys all have in front of you does just that. The paper documents how, in some instances, the government already hinders physicians' ability to provide good care for their patients, and how under PPACA, these trends will only worsen. It also highlights some of the new mandates, regulations, which will be particularly disruptive for physicians. Yet, although the legislation is certainly bad for doctors, as I argue in my paper, it's always gonna be the patient that suffers the most. Medicare's physician reimbursement regimen is characterized by underpayments and perverse incentives. During the pro prolonged healthcare debate, supporters of PPACA praise this ability of Medicare to exploit its size to obtain lower provider fees. While Medicare can indeed bludgeon down physician fees in certain areas, as a physician, I would say that this isn't one of the program's greatest strengths, but actually one of its greatest weaknesses. Ultimately, the brunt of these underpayments are passed along to patients through restricted access, shorter visits, less doctor-patient face time, quick and early hospital discharges, and always compromised quality of care. And while this is certainly demoralizing, it's certainly frustrating for the physician, it's the patient who's left with less time to have their questions answered, less time to understand the treatment, less time to understand the illness. And unfortunately, rather than reforming this government's flawed payment system, PPACA merely expands its scope to more people. PPACA also establishes the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute to conduct research comparing the efficacy of medical and surgical treatments. The potential harm from this depends how this research is used. Federal regulators can easily use this research to ration care by fiscally punishing those physicians who choose to prescribe, quote unquote, less effective treatment. This research, coupled with payment changes, could easily pave the way for the government dictating to patients the treatments, the tests, the medicines, the procedures that a patient can and cannot have, irrespective of both personal preference and willingness to pay. Essentially, this would replace the professional judgment of physicians with rigid rules set by regulators in Washington, D.C. This one-size-fits-all approach just does not work for actual patients. Because after all, patients are individuals, not program robots, not machines. Take a hypothetical patient, Tim, who might quickly and positively respond to bathroom, achieve common treatment for UTI, while Tim's hypothetical cousin, Timberly, might take the same dose of the same drug for the same illness and get Steven Johnson syndrome, a severe, potentially fatal, adverse drug reaction. The problem is, which sounds very simple, is not everybody is the same. In medical school, future physicians are taught the same, patients don't always read the book. This emphasizes that patients can present differently with the same illness and respond differently to the same treatment. Physicians need flexibility to treat not the average patient, but the actual patient. Comparative effectiveness research ignores these crucial differences. It also ignores the various cultural, religious, and life experiences that physicians present with them to the exam room. Ultimately, comparative effectiveness research will 
limit choice, and stifle medical innovation. The newly established health insurance exchange also gives the federal government vast new control over physicians' practices. PPACA explicitly states that starting January 1, 2015, a qualified health plan can contract with a provider, quote, only if such provider implements such mechanisms to improve health care quality as the secretary may by regulation require, unquote. Depending on the guideline, this gives the federal government unprecedented new authority over physicians. And not just those physicians accepting Medicare and Medicaid patients, but over possibly any physician accepting any third party payer offered through the exchange. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. Of course quality of care is a good thing. But who should determine the definition of quality? Who knows best? This regulation seems to be based on the notion that bureaucrats at HHS from afar know better than the doctor actually examining, looking at, talking to the patient. This will force physicians to practice not the way that they were taught, but the way the government tells them. And ultimately, this will lead to poor quality care that restricts choice. PPACA also establishes a value-based payment modifier. This adjusts physicians' reimbursement based on health care quality as assigned by the Secretary of HHS, and also costs compared to other physicians. Essentially, what this does is it creates an acceptable cost for physician practices. And those physicians practicing above this arbitrary cutoff will be penalized. This will disincentivize physicians across the board. This will further push physicians to practice standardized care and put tremendous pressure on physicians to not order the tests, consults, procedures, medicines that patients may need. Ultimately, this is going to result in compromised care. And I think it's very safe to say that it won't be physicians and their patients experiencing the value from the value-based payment modifier. PPAC will strip away physician autonomy, drown doctors, doctors in bureaucracy, and drain job satisfaction. As our great profession deteriorates, older doctors are going to retire well, younger doctors are gonna to look to pursue something else. Many young people, just a few years younger than me, although I guess a few years younger plus one since I'm the birthday boy, but um, will consider pursuing other opportunities. The supply of providers will dwindle as the demand for services reaches an all-time high. Ultimately, the consequences of the healthcare overhaul law will be passed along to patients through restricted access, long waits for appointments, and inevitably, ration care. I humbly think a better approach for reform would be to build off the success of the current system, yet target the inevitable shortcomings. Common sense solutions like tort reform, creating a real national health market for health insurance, I think would go a long way towards A, lowering costs, but also guaranteeing that patients receive the care that they need and that they want. Throughout this few uh, year long ordeal, President Obama has repeatedly said that he'd be willing to consider serious proposals from the other side. This Galen White paper does just that. It's not a political piece, it's clinical. And no matter how you look at it, this recently passed legislation is always going to be very bad for patients. And that's it. <laughs>